And our, our first presenter is going to be Pratap Tokekar. Uh, he's an assistant professor with affiliations in computer science and electrical and computer engineering. Uh, and, and he's going to be presenting about his work in resilient motor robot team. Uh, with that, Pratap, please. Awesome. Uh, thanks a lot, Yazi, for the, the kind introduction. And thank you for sticking around. Uh, um, uh, excited to tell you about some of the research that we've been doing on resilient multi-robot teaming. Uh, the motivation for uh, the work that my group does really comes from the recent interest in doing science in a data-driven fashion, right? So there's a lot of excitement surrounding data these days. Uh, scientists across many domains are increasingly relying on data uh, and machine learning techniques in order to understand uh, complex phenomena, right? Now, typically when we hear data, we think of the digital world, right? So we think of data that's uh, already there in the digital world, uh, in like, images, uh, uh, social media data, cell phone data, financial transaction records, uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, in, in all of these cases, the data is uh, available uh, in, in the form of some nice, uh, conveniently packaged APIs. And then as researchers, we can just download the data and then sort of run our machine learning inference algorithms um, uh, on this. Right? Uh, but besides the digital world, there is a whole another world out there, uh, the physical world, uh, where there is interest in doing science in a data-driven fashion. Right? So think of ecologists, agronomists, uh, folks who study climate science. Uh, they are all interested in using data um, and, and some of the new machine learning techniques that we are developing. Uh, in order to study and understand complex phenomena. Uh, the challenge, uh, the bottleneck here is, however, right at the source. Right? So you're collecting data itself is a challenge. Right? So this is uh, often referred to as the 3D problem of uh, data collection. So data collection in the physical world can be dull, like you have to sit for long periods of time for interesting data to occur. Uh, it can be dirty, right? So you, I mean, we, we are in, in the uh, Washington DC area and often uh, if you're working with uh, ecologists, you may have to go out in swamp to collect uh, interesting data. And it can be dangerous. Uh, often interesting data happens at, uh, at dangerous locations. Think of folks who are studying uh, active volcanoes, right? So the overarching vision, vision for my lab is to uh, use robots as data gathering agents, as autonomous data gathering agent. Right? Uh, so the, the underlying research question that drives uh, the research that my group does uh, is really about how we can get a team of heterogeneous robots uh, in order to, uh, uh, to plan their paths in order to collect interesting data from the wild efficiently. So there's a lot of keywords over here and, and throughout this talk, I'll try to uh, talk, uh, I'll try to give you a flavor of the research that we are doing uh, for each of these keywords, right? So we're interested in using a team of heterogeneous robots uh, to actively plan their paths, right? So to figure out where to collect the data from, when to collect the data, in order to learn something interesting about the environment uh, in an efficient fashion. So, and your efficiency is going to be in the form of sample efficiency. You want to learn with as little data as possible. And here, because you have robots that are collecting data, you can actively plan their paths in order to improve the sample efficiency of your learning process, right? So in my group, we sort of uh, wear two hats. Uh, on the one hand, we, we focus on algorithmic questions and, and really try to understand the, uh, the theory uh, underlying this research question. Uh, and we like to sort of prove uh, some, some, some guarantees about performance uh, of these algorithms for doing active data collection. Uh, and then we also have this other hat where we like, would like to build systems and deploy them in the real world in proof of concept deployments, because often uh, these proof of concept deployments bring out challenges and many times research challenges uh, that drives the next version of our research. So we've been involved in, in a variety of research problems uh, um, in, in variety of domains. Uh, I'm going, not going to be able to talk about all the research that we are doing in this area, but I'd like to give you a flavor of some of the work that we've been doing. So I'll start with our work on uh, using robots in precision agriculture. Right? Uh, and the idea in precision agriculture is to do agriculture in a data-driven fashion. Right? So again, the, the, the vision here is to use 
uh, aerial as well as ground robots that are equipped with scientific sensors. Uh, so these can be like infrared sensors, uh, moisture sensors, salinity sensors, sensors that can measure organic matter concentration, uh, vision sensors, LIDAR sensors, thermal cameras, and so on. Uh, use uh, data from these sensors in order to build a map of the health of your farm, right? Uh, so that then uh, when you want to apply your fertilizer, for example, uh, you can apply it at the right time at the right places, leading to tremendous environmental as well as cost benefits. Right? So my group has been building these systems uh, consisting of aerial and ground robots to do data collection uh, in agriculture. Now, as I said, there are two hats that we wear. Uh, so we li also like to uh, design algorithms uh, for these kinds of problems where we can give some theoretical performance guarantee and advance the state of the art and the theory dimension as well. Right? So one problem that, uh, one class of problem that we've been studying motivated by this uh, application of precision agriculture is how we can get a team of robots that are equipped with uh, sensors uh, to learn some underlying spatial field. So some field that varies, uh, let's say on a 2D plane uh, in uh, as little time as possible. Right? So specifically the problem that we've been looking at is if you have a robot that can go and take point measurements of some underlying spatially varying field, uh, how can we design a path for the robot to ensure that after we've done the data collection uh, the mean square error in our prediction for every point in the environment is below some user defined threshold. Right? So we are, uh, uh, the, the error in our prediction for every point everywhere throughout our environment is, um, is within some acceptable margin. Right? And what we would like to do here is to minimize the total time taken by the robot uh, to, to be able to make this kind of a guarantee. Right? So in, in an earlier presentation, uh, Michael Oti uh, talked about information theoretic techniques uh, and the fact that they often have this submodularity diminishing returns property. And that actually commonly shows up in these kinds of problems. So there's been a lot of work uh, over the years on information theoretic uh, planning to, to learn spatial fields. Right? Uh, and, and they work really well. The one place where uh, uh, they don't work is, is being able to make guarantees for every single point in the environment. Right? So often these information theoretic criteria uh, look at the average uh, uncertainty or the average accuracy over the entire field. Uh, and they are able to drive that below the user defined value. But if you want to be accurate everywhere in your environment, uh, you can't really get too far uh, with this information theoretic measure. Uh, so over the past couple of years, one of my students, Varun Suryan, has been uh, designing algorithms uh, that really exploits the underlying spatial geometry that shows up in many of these problems in order to, uh, uh, to come up with an alternate way of uh, planning paths for the robots to ensure that we are satisfying this criteria uh, while at the same time minimizing the time taken uh, for the robot to learn the field. Uh, this problem uh, and sort of cl this class of problems, uh, they're of all uh, in peak uh, hard problems. So, uh, what we have are constant factor approximation algorithms where we can sort of give guarantees on uh, the total time taken by the algorithm. Uh, I won't go over the details, but uh, the key insight here is that we can sort of show that uh, show uh, some uh, structural results saying that. If you want to be accurate, then no point can be more than a certain distance away from a measurement location. And then sort of we give uh, some matching conditions to say that if you take these many number of measurements, then you can be accurate within a certain neighborhood. Right? Uh, but sort of using this uh, spatial uh, properties, we are able to give uh, uh, guarantees on the total time taken by the algorithm in order to learn the entire field uh, up to the user defined value. Right? Now, I'll put my experimental hat on again. Uh, so if you find a path for the robot, let's say an aerial robot to uh, go do this data collection, that's great. Uh, and that works in theory. But in practice, we often have to contend with uh, limited energy capacities of aerial robots, especially multi-rotors uh, um, uh, when you're um, uh, operating in large fields. Right? 
so one line of work that we've been uh, thinking about is uh, in these kinds of settings, if we are going to have both aerial robots as well as ground robots operating in close proximity of each other, can we get these aerial robots to collaborate with the ground robots and vice versa uh, in order to increase the operational efficiency of the system, right? And so specifically, uh, if periodically we can have these aerial robots uh, autonomously land on this ground platform uh, and have the ground platform essentially act as a mule uh, transporting this aerial robot from one deployment location to the next, then we'll be saving some energy along the way. Uh, this still sort of is uh, a, a challenging optimization problem. Uh, we call this as a symbiotic planning problem. Uh, it's still challenging because you don't want to land every single time. Uh, it still costs you some energy to take off and land. So you have to solve that optimization in addition to the, the planning that you are doing. Uh, but for this class of problems, uh, we have a series of results, uh, mostly the work of my uh, student, Kevin Yu, who just defended his PhD thesis last week. Uh, and one such result that, uh, that we have is uh, sort of showing how to plan paths for aerial and ground robots to monitor a set of points. Uh, and his algorithm uh, sort of not only takes in uh, your aerial and ground robot, but it also takes in a whole bunch of system parameters, uh, like the takeoff time, landing time. It, uh, it can also account for the fact that the aerial plat the ground platform can also recharge the aerial station, uh, the aerial robot along the way. It takes a recharging rate into account and so on and so forth. Uh, and so we have a, a, a series of results for different types of coverage problems for covering a set of points, for covering area, uh, for covering 3D regions uh, with the symbiotic air ground system. And we've also shown uh, a proof of concept uh, experimental demonstration of this system. Uh, this is a fully autonomous system with uh, the aerial robot autonomously landing on the ground platform and the ground robot then transporting it to the next deployment location and so on and so forth. Right. Uh, so in, in addition to this agriculture uh, uh, application, we've also been looking into other types of uh, environmental monitoring uh, and inspection problems. Uh, so recently we've uh, have a collaboration with folks in civil engineering uh, looking at how to use aerial robots uh, to do visual inspection of uh, infrastructure, uh, such as bridges, uh, to look for things like defects, right? So you have uh, cracks that may appear, you may have uh, corrosion, spalding, and all, all sorts of other defects that may appear on bridges. Uh, typically, uh, bridges are inspected manually, so someone has to go in and manually inspect, uh, visually inspect every part of the bridge. Uh, some of this routine inspection can be automated by having uh, aerial robots equipped with high resolution cameras to do the inspection. Uh, so as part of this project, we've been looking at uh, the, the, uh, how to do autonomous navigation in this environment. Uh, this is a very challenging environment. As you can see, we are operating in close proximity to the bridge. Uh, the GPS information cuts in and out as we go under the bridge. Uh, there's interference sort of because of all sorts of other uh, uh, ferromagnetic materials in the vicinity. Uh, your lighting conditions may change dramatically uh, as you go in and out, uh, and so on and so forth. So, for autonomous uh, navigation around these bridge structures, uh, as well as uh, doing coverage and inspection of this bridge. Uh, uh, in an efficient fashion. So I won't go into the details of the algorithm, but I would encourage you to look at some of our work if you're interested in this area. Right. Um, and uh, the third class of uh, problems or third class of applications that we've been looking at is that of environmental monitoring. Uh, so this is mostly work by my uh, now former PhD student, uh, Yun Chan Sun, who is a postdoc at MIT. Uh, uh, with Yun Chang, uh, we had a collaboration with uh, someone who uh, is an environmental scientist who was interested in uh, studying the transport of uh, aerosolized particles uh, that are released from uh, things like pollutants or other hazardous materials that get released in water bodies. Right? So it's something like a chemical spill that happens in a water body and these particles get aerosolized, get released in the air and then get transported through the air. And so what we've uh, 
I've been working on are designing algorithms for aerial robots that can act as scouts, uh, quickly covering an environment to uh, determine where the hazardous uh, locations are or where the hazard is concentrated. And then having the aerial robots collaborate with uh, surface vehicles. So these are robotic boats uh, that have a physical sampler on them uh, that can go to these uh, locations with high concentration and then collect uh, uh, physical samples of the water column that can then be analyzed ex situ in the lab. And so we have a number of algorithms for doing uh, this coordinated uh, data collection with aerial robots and, and, and surface vehicles. Now in the last uh, minute or so, I want to talk about some uh, work that uh, was really motivated by a number of failures that we had uh, when doing experiments. So here's a, a video that I like to show. This is from an experiment uh, in, in Virginia. This is my student Kevin uh, manually landing the, the aerial robot. We release it and then maybe you won't be able to see it, but just in a second, you'll at least see the tree shake. Right? And that's because this aerial robot decided that the fastest way to go where it was going was to go right through the tree and it wasn't able to sense the fact that there is a tree along the way. Right? Uh, so there's obviously a lot of work that's going on in improving the perception uh, and, and planning and control algorithms to make individual robots uh, more robust. Uh, what my group has been focusing on is um, uh, looking at resiliency in a team uh, of robots. Right? So here we are taking the sort of pessimistic view saying that we have a team of robots and some subset of robots are going to fail. Right? And we can't avoid that. No matter what we do, some robots are going to fail. Maybe they fail because of natural causes. Maybe they fail because some adversary is actively uh, bringing down some of our robots. Given that we know some robots are going to fail, what can we do to make the team as a whole resilient? Uh, so I won't go again over the details. I'm running uh, short of time here, uh, but we have been looking at this problem, this uh, uh, game theoretic problem of uh, planning strategies for a team of robots, uh, knowing fully well that some subset is going to be attacked, but we don't know which subset is going to be attacked. Right? So how do I coordinate the actions of my team uh, so that no matter what subset of robots goes down, I'm still maximizing my performance. Right. So this can be thought of as a, a Stackelberg game. And we have been thinking about this in the context of optimizing some modular functions. Uh, we have a number of results, both for the centralized fashion and the decentralized fashion. So I'll just uh, pull up this slide, which has a summary of the results. Uh, uh, this is mostly work by my PhD student, Lefong Zhu, uh, who just graduated and is a postdoc now at Penn. Uh, and two of my current students, Guangyao uh, Shi and Ishat, uh, both of whom are there in the poster session. So I would encourage you to go stop by their poster and talk to them. Uh, we also just published a survey. Uh, it's available on archive um, on some of the recent work on risk aware and this resilient planning for multi-robot teams in adversarial environment. So I'd encourage you to take a look at the survey uh, if you're interested in this area. So with that, uh, I'm going to stop uh, by reminding you of uh, the overarching vision that we want to get a team of robots to plan their paths to gather data efficiently from the wild where some robots may fail. So thank you for your attention. And if there's time, I'm happy to answer a question. If not, we can skip and I can answer questions in the Q&A session. Thank you. Thank you so much, Pratap. Uh, and again, I'll clap for everybody. Um, I, we do have one question from George, uh, George Contondis. Hi, hi, George. Um, and he asks, we have, we have several questions. I'll ask one of them. Um, I guess in the special uh, field mapping, you use the kernel with the same variability at every direction, and you assume a stationary random field. If yes, have you thought of a way to map non-stationary random fields? Yes. Yeah, so, so in that word, the, the dirty laundry is we assume that it's a, it's a spatial field with uh, model by a Gaussian process with known hyperparameters uh, for a squared exponential kernel. Uh, we have not yet uh, looked at non-stationary random fields, but that's exactly the problem that my student has been uh, thinking about. Uh, and 
hopefully george uh, i know uh, at some point you're going to show up at umd so we'd love to chat a little bit more to see how to to extend some of these results for non stationary random fields i, I just want to uh, uh, preface that uh, you guys are uh, know each other and so this might have been a plant uh, so i'm on to uh, I, I wish it were but no um, okay so with that uh, thank you so much for um and we are going to be moving